Hello everybody, this is Graham Anderson and today I'm going to be looking at Dominant Species Marine. A little background. The very first convention I ever went to, I was lucky enough to have someone teach me the very first Dominant Species, and I fell in love with the game. It was in my top 5 games of all time for many, many years. So when they were said they're going to make another game in this series that actually re-implements the first game, but offers some differences, I figured I had to get this one and get it to the table as soon as possible. Now for the point of this review, I'm going to assume that you have not played the first game and will not be comparing this to the original. So this game is a worker placement or action selection style game. You'll be fighting over other players for domination on the different tiles that are set up on the board through the actions of course that you've selected. It is a mean game where you cannot turtle and must be aggressively taking over terrain tiles and battling the other players. So will this game become the dominant against all other competitors or will it be lost to the annals of time? Let's get it to the table, see how it's played, and then come back for my final thoughts on Dominant Species Marine. Before I go into the rules overview, I do want to say that they are a very brief overview. I've tried to keep them as quick as possible and just given you the actions and kind of the major game flow, but don't use them as a way to learn the game. They're just kind of a reference so you understand how the game flows. So with that, let's go to the overview. So here's Dominant Species Marine set up for three players. Since the board is so large, I'm leaving the player boards off to one side. They will hold your gene pool, that is your cubes. They also hold a trait card, and they show you what type of food you can eat, as listed across the top. Players will also have action cylinders based on the player count. So for this three-player game, each player has five cylinders of their color. I'm not going to go through all the rules, as there are a fair number of them, so I'll explain the board layout. Then I'll do a quick look at the different actions available in the game, and give you an idea of the game flow. The central part of the game board is set up the same way in each game. It has several different terrain tiles, and there are seven base types, and hydrothermal vents, which can be placed on top of the other tiles, which make the bottom tile irrelevant. Each terrain tile will have zero to six food chits available on the terrain. If a food element chit is on the corner of a hex, that hex has that food available to all animals on this hex. A food element chit represents one of the six different food types available on Earth. At the beginning of the game, the central tile is a coral reef. Each player will have three of their species on that tile, and the tile has one of each food type available so all animals can eat. Now there are three types of cards in the game. The first is the survival card, which I'll talk about later. There are also trait cards, and at the beginning of the game each player is dealt three of them and they choose one. This trait will give your animal a special ability. And finally the evolution cards. At the beginning of the game, ten are removed from the deck randomly, and the asteroid card, which is the timer for the game, is shuffled into the bottom four cards of the deck. Then, five evolution cards are placed face up on the board. Pull food element chits from the bag and add them to all the empty spaces with the jellyfish. Then, draw terrain tiles from the other bag and place them on all the terrain markers, which are the starfish. All the terrain tiles are shuffled and put three face down piles with the top one turned up. Each player places a cube on the VP track and a cube on the food chain section. The dominance markers are placed on the board along with their matching chits on the one point of the VP track. Let's jump forward a few turns so it will be easier to explain the different actions that can be taken on a turn. Turn order is always based on reversed food chain order, so the player furthest down the food chain will go first. On a player's turn, they will take one action, either placing a cylinder or retrieving all of the cylinders from the board. To place a cylinder, you can place it on any open action space as long as it is to the right and below of any of your other cylinders already on the board. So if my first action is to go here, I cannot place my second cylinder here for example. So let's go through the actions quickly. The Abundance action allows you to take a food element from the display and add it to an empty corner of a hex. Autotrophs means that you can either replace an element around a hydrothermal vent, or remove a matching element from the hydrothermal vent. The vent must match the action you took, either the smoker vent, which is the underwater, or geysers, which are on land. Depletion allows you to remove a food element from anywhere on the earth as long as it matches a food element in this action space. Adaptation allows you to take a food element and add it to one of the three empty spaces on your species board. No animal can have more than six food elements. If you already have six, your action is forfeit. You do not replace elements on your board. Regression is the only action in the display that you will not take an immediate action. Instead, you'll place a cube here and protect yourself from losing a matching food element from your species when the regression step happens during a reseed event, and I'll be talking about that later. Speciesation is how you get more species onto the board. Whichever food element you select, you'll speciate around one matching food element on Earth. You'll place your cubes from your gene pool onto the surrounding terrain tiles, and the number you place is dependent on the terrain tiles. Wanderlust is how new terrain is added to the board. Select from any of the face-up tiles and add it to the board. Place it in any empty space that is adjacent to a tile. Select one food element from the Wanderlust action and add it to the corner of the newly placed terrain. 
you will gain bonus VP for all the matching surrounding terrain tiles plus one for itself. So if I place it here next to this matching tile, it's a total of two, so I'd get three points. Then in food chain order, that is from top to bottom, if players have species in adjacent terrain to the newly placed terrain, they can move as many as they want onto this new tile. Tectonics is how new hydrothermal vents appear. Select a non-vent tile at the edge of the grid, remove all species from the hex and set them aside. Place the vent on the appropriate side up. You'll gain VP based on the number of vents around it, just like the Wanderlust action. Next, each species that was set aside return one of each color back to the tile, and the rest go back to their owner's gene pool. Finally, as the active player, you can place an additional one from either your gene pool or an eliminated one. Migration allows you to move species around. You can move the number of species the action space depicts, but each species can only move once. Competition is a way to remove rivals. For the train of the action, you can eliminate one, two, or three species from the train that you also occupy. Eliminated species are always out of the game. They do not go back to that person's gene pool. Evolution is going to be a major way to score points. You'll pick one terrain tile that matches the terrain of the action space you picked, and these terrain chits are sorted when drawn from the bag. On your chosen terrain tile, the person with the most species on the tile will score the most points, then the person with the next most gets the next points, etc. In the case of a tie, ties are always broken in food chain order. The higher order species will always win. Once the terrain tile has been scored, you must pick an evolution card from the display. The action space you select will have a number, and you can only choose up to that from the track. So, if it was a 3, you can only choose one card from the first three cards on the display. Now let's have a quick look at the evolution cards. In the center is the action that will be triggered when someone chooses it during the evolution scoring. The gold section of cards are only activated when that card is first drawn when refilling the evolution roll. A dark blue section of the card will affect the gameplay as long as that's in the evolution roll. Fish bones means that there's an extinction event in which all players must check to make sure all their species on the board can eat something on the train tile that they are on. That is, if one of the food elements on the train tile match a food element on their player board. If this species cannot eat, it is eliminated from the game. A fat fish means a survival event happens. Players see who has the most species on vent tiles. The player with the most is given the survival card, and they will score bonus points based on how many vent tiles they are on. After the evolution action, cards are shifted down and a new card is drawn, making sure to immediately activate the gold section of a newly drawn card, and any new dark blue rules come into play. Domination allows you to claim special pawns. There is one for each food element. To claim one, pick one food element, add up the food elements from your player board, then count up the number of train tiles that your species is on that also has that same food element available. Multiply these two numbers, and if the total number is greater than the current position of the food element marker on the VP board, you now dominate that food element and gain the matching special pawn. Also take the matching special pawn marker. These special pawns work exactly the same as normal pawns with a few exceptions. They do not have to follow the same rules of placement. That is, they can be placed above any previously placed pawns. They can also bump other basic pawns of other players. But they cannot bump other special pawns. And finally, there are certain special actions as signified with the special pawn icon besides some of the action display that can only be used by the special pawns and offer a slightly stronger ability, but I'm not going to go into them through this walkthrough. The last action you can do is just retrieve all of your action cylinders from the action space. When you do this, you'll move your marker on the food chain from left to right. You will then continue taking turns as normal until all players have moved their marker. Then you will go into a reseed event. During a reseed event, remove all elements surrounded by exactly three vent tiles. Then perform regression. All players that do not have a cube next to the regression box must remove one food element from their player board that matches the food elements in the box. You will never lose your printed on food elements though. Next, remove all the regression elements and move the food elements down from adaption into the regression box. Then, remove all the food elements from depletion, speciesation, and wanderlust. Move the other food elements down following the arrows. Finally, remove all the train chits, then draw new food elements and train chits for all the empty spaces. And finally, move all the cubes back to the left on the food chain list. The game ends at the next reseed event after a player has taken the asteroid evolution card. Again, this will be somewhere in the last five cards of the draw pile. You do one final extinction event, followed by one survival event, then each and every terrain tile is scored, and finally each player who has a special pawn will score points based on the position of the matching food element tile on the VP track. And finally, the player with the most points is the winner. Note that I have skipped over a lot of the fine details of the actions, but want to give you a decent overview of how the game plays and flows. Let's get back to see what I thought about Dominant Species Marine. On to theme and components. The theme in this one is spot on. I felt the actions you were taking were so integrated with the theme of the game, they just made sense. I mean, you're getting more sources of food on the board, adapting your species, expanding out, and of course, competing against the other players. 
I felt the theme in this one works so well, so definitely high marks for that. The components though, these were decent. The main board is big as you saw from the overview, and the player boards are large as well, so it takes up an awful lot of table space. The player boards, although thin, do have all the actions listed on them, which definitely is a plus. The cards are good quality, and I do like the art on the cards. The art on the main board is pretty basic, but functional, so all in all, all the components, including, including the wooden components, they're fine. There's nothing that's going to blow you away on the component side. Let's go on to the gameplay. There is a lot I like about this game, but I understand this is not going to be for everyone. The game is highly interactive and very confrontational. Every turn and every action you're either trying to protect yourself from being attacked or being overwhelmed by an opponent, or it's you being the attacker or the aggressor. There's little to no turtling in this game, you know, that's going off to maybe one corner of the board and just kind of setting up shop so no one attacks you. If you don't like direct confrontation games, this one may not be for you. For me, I really enjoyed it in this game. The actions you're taking are also very thematic. They all revolve around you expanding your species and making it easier for you to survive while making it difficult for your opponents to survive. The added restriction of always having to place below your previously placed action pawn was intriguing as well. Often you really want something further down on the action list, but you'd be passing up other actions that maybe other players might find beneficial. Because sometimes you had to take an action just so another player couldn't take it. You need to be watching everyone's situation on the board. You know, is there an evolution card out there that would be really benefit one player with a lot of points? If so, do I maybe score a tile that I maybe I'm not even leading on just so I can get that card away from the person? So things like that are one of my big pauses for the game. You know, it's how you have good deep decisions in just about every turn. But of course, the board situation usually helps you focus on a few good actions to choose from. As for the player count, I played this at two, three, and four players, and the two-player game we played was just, you know, one species each. This is a very different game than a full four-players game, and I would say it's definitely best at four players. You know, even playing at two players, there is a variant where both players take two species to make the game board as tight as possible, and really that's what you want. At four players, this game truly shines. Everyone is in everyone's face, pushing and shoving to get dominance on certain tiles. But I also like that there were a few different ways to approach the game. You can definitely go after the land tiles. Those are worth the most points when you score them. You know, and you maybe want to score those as many times as possible. But you're probably going to have a good battle in there because people are going to pile on you to make sure you don't get those points. But someone might try and sneak onto those events because that survival action can be a lot of points every time the event happens. Now, another aspect of scoring that I haven't mentioned yet was the dominance markers. You know, getting at least one is critical. Being able to place it above your other action pawns or in a special action space is very important. And honestly, using that bumping ability can also be a strategic play. But not only the in-game benefits are, are good, but the game and scoring benefits from those markers as well adds to maybe additional decision points. You know, do you try and get a few of those markers, steal them from other players? Or do you try and focus on one and get that domination VP as high as possible to score a bunch of points at the end of the game? Kind of the choice is yours. Now, one of the few negatives I have with this game is actually the length. This is definitely a longer game. It can last two and a half to three plus hours with four players. Even at two players, most of my games lasted an hour and a half to two hours. And during that time play, you can definitely see the ebb and flow of the game. It has a really good game arc. You know, you start with just three cubes on the board, but by the end of the game, your species has grown, hopefully. You know, it's spread out and managed to find what works best for your species. But during that entire gameplay, you are fighting for just about everything on the board. And doing that for three hours can be a little tough and trying on some people. Now, another slight negative I have for the game it's actually the randomness, and this is probably my biggest negative. The reseed randomness, I'm fine with. You know, resetting most of the chits is fine. It's the randomness of those cards with those gold, blue, and events coming up. They can definitely change the flow of the game. Not so much the, the dark blue events, but those gold events usually have some removing chits or some other negative action on them. Like, remove all the worms from all the action displays. If you're halfway through an age and are planning on using those worms, and they're just swept out from underneath you, with no warning, that's kind of tough to take. Now, it's, not, it's definitely not like the uh, player's actions they can do, like the depletion or the auto tropes, because you can see that. You can see the possibility that's going to happen to you, and you can stop or minimize it, but those evolution events just happen with no warning, and they can definitely harm one player worse than the others. So, not a huge fan of those. Now, again, it's not a game-breaking negative, but just enough to, to drop my score a little bit. So, would I recommend this game? Definitely. If you're looking for a thoroughly engaging, longer game where you are in your opponent's face for the entire game, battling it out for 
for the very survival of your species, you need to play this game. There are many things that I enjoyed about the game. You know, the action selection restrictions, combined with the ability to use those dominance markers to kind of bend those rules, was fantastic. The different ways to score points is excellent. You know, are you going to go after the vent scoring, or land tiles, or the wonderless combos, or the tectonics combos, or the evolution cards? It's just going to depend on your current situation. But all this boils down for me to one of the game's strengths, the interesting, meaningful decisions to be made on each turn. You're usually weighing multiple options on just about every action selection. I never felt like I was railroaded into playing the game a certain way. I almost always felt like I had good, viable options depending on what the other players were doing. And for me, that's the other huge plus for me, the player interaction. You need to be watching what other people are doing. This is definitely not multiplayer solitaire. Now, of course, there are a few negatives for me that do knock the game down a bit. The game length, it's an issue. But this is a game I feel you're going to be planning a game day around, which might make it more difficult to get to the table in other situations. The only other negative I have, and it's led to frustration at the, at the table due to the length of the game, is the randomness. For much of the game, you're trying to strategically plan your move. And to have a random card come up that just messes it up can be annoying. I never felt that this was game breaking. I've never had someone lose a game because of one of the events, but it can force you to pivot your strategy fairly quickly and approach your next turns differently than you may, that uh, may not be as advantageous to you as it previously was. So this is a game I thoroughly enjoyed and have no problem recommending it to you. But I also understand that this is a game that's not going to appeal to everyone, but I'm going to give it an 8.5 out of 10 and the Dice Tower Seal of Excellence. This is a game that, even if you don't think you're going to like it, is definitely worth a play, and you never know, I might end up dominating your collection. But that's it for now. Until next time, thanks for watching.